Hey guys, I hope you're well. Hope you had a good break over the Christmas and New Year period. Uh, we're back in the office now, the home office that is. Um, so today we're going to be talking about Bitcoin, the genomic revolution, Tesla, uh, Elon Musk becoming the richest man in the world and lots of other different things. So first of all, like this video if you enjoy it comment down below if you want to you want me to cover anything more uh in further detail um because i'm gonna go through a few different topics uh today so we had some uh pretty pretty hectic scenes uh, on capitol hill um but didn't really move markets the s p 500 and the dow jones uh hit record highs uh on the back of the news uh of the blue wave returning. Uh, so the blue wave is back on the Democratic Party, uh, of course, uh, Biden, Biden's party was uh, is actually going to take control of the House and Senate. So what does this mean for financial markets? Because that's really what we're, we care about. This is going to be uh, a lot uh, easier for Biden and the Democratic Party uh, to advance kind of legislative uh, priorities when he takes office. This means basically a larger probability uh, of stimulus checks for U.S. citizens and households. And rather than the $600 stimulus check that was kind of forecasted, it's more likely to be $2,000. Uh, there's also an increased prospect of larger fiscal stimulus support. Uh, Biden's basically pledged to expand the $900 billion stimulus uh, boost agreed in Congress. Uh, and this is feeding more and more expectations that the government spending is going to push up inflation. So all inflation related kind of assets and equity sectors are benefiting on the back of new this news. So banks, materials, energy shares. Um, this is kind of a flow through what we kind of talked about in our equity sector outlook. So if you haven't watched that, uh, go and check that out for this year. Um, this is kind of a follow on from that. The reflation trade is real uh, and these kind of uh, assets are benefiting uh, greatly. Um, uh, and they've been really unloved uh, in, the, in the previous year where kind of tech names took uh, the kind of uh, focus uh, and the flows. Now these kind of deep value uh, cyclical names are actually uh, benefiting from this. Okay. Um, there's also more likelihood uh, of an infrastructure spending package. So in the near term uh, and uh, in the longer term, this is more economic growth, which of course is much needed after the kind of coronavirus shock. Okay. Uh, of course, we've got the Fed still there uh, in the most recent policy meeting. They pretty much uh, you know, made a commitment for this 120 billion per month asset purchase program to remain in place. Um, so they're going to be there uh, with their foot on the pedal. So it's looking good in terms of the monetary and fiscal support heading into the year. OK, we need to obviously watch the velocity of money. OK, and this is a big kind of proponent of um, inflation. Velocity of money completely stopped pretty much. Uh, when we were all in lockdown, and, but that is really a function of the lockdown. Okay, so when we are uh, allowed out um, and we get the vaccines, that velocity of money you'd expect to pick up, and this could fuel uh, some more inflation kind of worries, uh, but actually some much needed inflation. Uh, Treasury yields sold off quite dramatically, yields hit uh, 1%. <clears throat> And above, uh, and this is really the supply needed to finance this fiscal spending. Banks obviously benefited from this, from the steeper yield curve, and this was the steepest since 2017. Um, and the KBW Bank Index was up, you know, up six, seven, eight percent uh, at times. The tech-heavy Nasdaq. I mean, most indices now are pretty, pretty tech-heavy, uh, but the Nasdaq was red and did lag the other indices. This is really uh, a higher yield story being factored into the kind of lo lofty valuations that we've, we see uh, and have seen over the last kind of couple of years, which means lower present value of cash flows. So the, really the investors and the valuations were really taking into account the prospect of higher yields um, that who knows if we're, how, how high those yields can go uh, and whether the Fed will kind of uh, step in to kind of cap that. Um, but let's see how this kind of uh, story plays out. Really, another kind of uh, aspect of this was the higher corporation tax uh, or the threat of uh, from the Biden administration. This is really, I think, unlikely until kind of 2022. 2022. Um, but uh, it has been seen that the tech names are quite sensitive to that. But 
moral of the story is inflation expectations are ticking up. Banks, small caps, and economically uh, cyclical kind of sectors are benefiting from this. We have to talk about Bitcoin. Uh, so when um, over the Christmas and New Year period, Bitcoin was steadily, steadily cri- uh, climbing, even from November. So if you've got some Bitcoin in your stocking, you're pretty, pretty lucky. Um, it really exceeded 34,000 and hit 40,000 just yesterday. Um, and it's really testament to the kind of institutional flow and acceptance. Um, you get more and more corporate treasuries converting their kind of lower yielding uh, treasury holdings uh, into this Bitcoin kind of element. And really, this is uh, a fight against uh, fiat currency debasement. OK, so uh, the Fed are printing money uh, and continuing to print money, uh, the more dollars in supply. Uh, really assets in kind of dollar dollar terms are becoming debased. And this is kind of the threat. Um, but I think what we can see is Bitcoin is becoming more you know, institutionally accepted. You hear more and more, you know, famous investors like Paul Tudor Jones, Drucken Miller, uh, even Skybridge Capital have just released a kind of crypto fund. So lots of uh, kind of investors are trying to get a piece of this Bitcoin action. You've even got PayPal, um, giving U.S. customers the option to hold that hold Bitcoin in their digital wa- uh, wallets. Um, so all of this is just fueling the fire of Bitcoin infiltrating the traditional monetary system, and it's being valued not really as a, a currency, but more of a store of value. And it's actually the network and the network effects. The more uh, kind of like Moore's law, the more people that have Bitcoin and use Bitcoin, the more valuable it becomes. This is a bit like Facebook, Amazon etc and all of the tech giants the more users there are the more valuable it becomes okay i think the big threat um is that there's lots of big whales holding bitcoin so more than two thousand wallets contain over a thousand bitcoin uh so if you do a thousand times forty thousand some big big numbers there so um very concentrated kind of in its supply. Um, and that's why we tend to see big corrections, uh, like in 2017, for example, after a big run up. If there is um, some profit taking, if you want to call it that, you can see the price move quite violently. Um, but I think myself and other kind of uh, commentators uh, believe that these corrections are healthy and that it has made kind of higher highs and higher lows. Um, since all of these corrections, even from when it was like $8 in, in 2011. So uh, I did a LinkedIn post just exploring about, you know, if it's surging towards 40,000, it's becoming more institutional, institutionally accepted, um, you know, being seen as a safe haven asset, why did it lose half of its value in March? Uh, and really the argument and really defense of Bitcoin was that in times of crisis, just like we saw in March 2020 uh, and in 2018, sorry, uh, 2008, the global financial crisis, it's really a form of a liquidity crisis. So investors are liquidating their positions really to scramble for dollars. OK, so gold and treasuries, they're considered safe haven assets traditionally. So why did they provide to fail? Um, sorry, provide uh, an adequate hedge in March when everything was selling off? If you've got a margin call, you need dollars. If you want to buy oil, you need dollars. If you want to pay your foreign dollar denominated debt, you need dollars. So in March, it was different because the financial plumbing was really not functioning properly. Uh, and the majority of uh, you know market participants and transactors needed dollars at that time. The majority of financial transactions take place in dollars. This is why the Fed brought out the swap lines, backstopped the credit markets, because markets were not functioning as they were. Okay, so every, there was this dollar squeeze uh, and gold, Bitcoin, treasuries, all of these safe haven assets provide, uh, failed to provide a, an adequate hedge and actually got caught up in this. But to be honest, that is a dollar story and not you know, synonymous to Bitcoin. Uh, other assets got caught up in that. Now, everyone's ru- uh, running towards inflation hedges like we talked about, gold, Bitcoin, gold's up 22%, Bitcoin's up 370% uh, over the last year. And this is, again, a story of fiat currency debasement. Okay, And then even corporate treasuries are turning to Bitcoin. So Michael Saylor has been a a big uh, advocate of this, saying, why would I hold treasuries that yield nothing? And my dollars are being uh, kind of debased at 15 to 20% a year. I'm going to put something uh, into a hard asset 
like he considered gold, he considered real estate, but really Bitcoin was the most attractive to him uh, to appreciate um, despite the fiat currency debasement. Who knows what's next uh, for Bitcoin? It's definitely fun to watch. I'm definitely interested. Um, I do think a correction is probably uh, coming very soon. But again, uh, that's healthy. And I think as long as it doesn't com completely collapse, which I don't see happening, uh, I think you know people will be more and more interested in this pullback. SPACs, uh, another hot topic. Um, so uh, I had some questions from our Amplify Live Room and uh, questions on LinkedIn and things like that. Can you run through SPACs? So I'm going to do it now. Uh, 2020 year was really the year of the SPACs. Uh, this is essentially a special purpose acquisition company. And this is a way of private companies bypassing the traditional IPO process. Uh, and this is to gain access to public markets with lightning speed. It really is just uh, a reverse merger. The benefit versus IPOs is it's, there's an increased probability of execution and the time to uh, market is kind of uh, reduced quite dramatically. So many com companies in 2020 opted for SPACs uh, to really circumvent the COVID volatility rather than embark in a very long, uh, lengthy IPO process. We saw lots of uh, companies going public via a SPAC and record volume around 78 billion. WeWork actually pulled their IPO, if you remember, last year. Uh, and this was under intense regulatory and investor scrutiny uh, during the traditional IPO process. And I believe, actually, if we saw WeWork going public through a SPAC, that that would have actually gone through and you would see WeWork going through. Inherently, there's problems uh, or potential problems with the, the SPAC process. Uh, and this is inherent in the filing. So they file something called an S4 when you do a SPAC. Um, and this is uh, what's, uh, what's permitted in this is forward looking pro forma statements. So <clears throat> Virgin Galactic is a great example. They don't make any money now, but they potentially have huge revenues in the future. And this is obviously attractive if you are that type of company or even the tech names that don't make traditional profit now, but can forecast forecast out into the future to monetize, let's say, daily, monthly active users. These pro forma statements are not generally accepted by accounting principles, and they're prohibited in the S1 forms that you file uh, through uh, an IPO process. OK, so that's the kind of attraction with these, I guess, um, more forward looking companies OK, to be profitable in the future. That SPAC looks more and more attractive if you can talk about those forward looking statements. The, uh, another kind of um, worry for investors is the incentive. So founders take a promote fee of around 20% of the company as payment. And this is a kind of somewhat of a misalignment of incentives. The sponsor doesn't need to find a long term quality business. Instead, it, it may be able to go for a more speculative option that next them a really big return in the short term. And this is not synonymous again across all SPACs, but there are kind of those those uh, SPACs that do exist. A huge amount of trust needs to go uh, and be given to the management. Um, but with extremely savvy investors like uh, Bill Ackman and Shamath, you can definitely see the attraction. It's almost betting on them to make good decisions. Will it be the death of the IPO? Maybe I'll cover that uh, in a later video. I also did a great post uh, on the genomic revolution, and this is something that's definitely caught my my interest. And there's some serious innovation going on in this geno genomic space. Uh, and I'm definitely not a biologist, but uh, it's a very interesting topic that I've, I've looked into uh, and I really enjoy kind of the, but the potential for it. So uh, what you can see here is the kind of growth of genomic sequencing. Um, 2.6 million genomes were sequenced in 2019, 105 million genomes in 2024. Uh, and the cost to sequence a human genome, which is basically the genetic code that makes up humans, it's our kind of DNA, that's fallen from the kind of hundreds of millions, billions into the hundreds of dollars. So this is an exponential reduction in cost that is surely only likely to continue. OK, and according to ARC Investment Management, where this research paper is from, the white paper, um, we could reach 105 genome sequence in 2024, up from 2.6 million uh, in 2019. So why is this important? 
improvement in technology, computing, this is going to allow us to apply artificial intelligence, machine learning, I know all the buzzwords, and other techniques to analyze this larger data set of human genomes. Uh, and this is going to provide, just like Facebook, Google, Amazon, collecting all of this user data, um, you know, they're able to make applications for that uh, and, pro and it provides them with huge insights um, so imagine what that kind of wealth of data can be uh, what it can be used for in the kind of technology health technology space okay um, so for example using dna sequencing and crispr uh, technology they may be able to identify mutations in the in genes uh, that make up the genomes uh, edit remove them replace them uh, and I'm, I made a joke, I'm sure it's as easy as copy and pasting, um, but this is all in order to prevent illnesses like sickle cell anemia, cancer, blindness, uh, and hopefully cure them in the future. And this may be uh, suit, you know, closer than we think, but maybe by 2025, uh, 2030, this may become a reality. Okay, uh, this is also going to sharpen the precision of diagnostic medicines uh, and guide personalized medicine. Um, so these therapeutic pipelines in monetary terms could generate hundreds of billions of revenue and actually trillions of dollars in market cap uh, in the future. So we could even see a genomic company like Editas, like CRISPR, okay, like Intellia actually becoming the next trillion dollar company like Apple. We also need to talk about Elon Musk uh, and Tesla. So Tesla's continued to just make higher highs. Uh, it's on an absolute tear. Uh, and it has been up something like 800%, but it's actually now made um, Tesla uh, owner, Elon Musk, the richest man in the world. And he's actually surpassed uh, Jeff Bezos of Amazon, who held it um, since 2017. Okay, uh, Musk, um, is, Tesla actually hit a $700 billion market cap. Uh, on Wednesday, and this is the uh, most obviously valuable car company, Toyota, Volkswagen, Hyundai, GM, and Ford combined. Uh, and actually Dan Ives of Wedbush uh, Securities um, kind of talked about the Blue Senate. Um, so all the stuff we talked about earlier in the video being a uh, very bullish for Tesla, a potential game changer, of course, with the kind of uh, electric uh, vehicle tax credits that would benefit Tesla uh, and a, overall a more focus on uh, kind of renewable energy uh, and that electric vehicle sector uh, as, a, as a whole. And we're even seeing uh, kind of companies like Plug uh, do extremely well, like up a thousand percent talking about that kind of renewable energy story. So Musk, his personal wealth has been boosted uh, uh, by eight, the eightfold surge in Tesla. Um, so he's done extremely well, uh, of course, and it's around 190 billion. And there's a quite a funny exchange uh, on Twitter from the Tesla owners of Silicon Valley. He just put how strange. Well, back to work, which is very synonymous of uh, Elon Musk. So I hope you enjoyed this kind of uh, this video covering a lots of different topics. If you if you heard something in the video that you want me to cover kind of in more detail, uh, I'm more than happy to. I hope you enjoyed the video. Make sure you like and subscribe the video for more content from myself and the team. Take care.